So we're used to a technological market that says, you know, I have an iPhone 6. <coughs> well, actually, no, I don't have an iPhone 7. Um, you know, I'm not getting an iPhone 8, and anyone who's stupid enough to pay 10 grand for an iPhone X deserves all they get. Um, I can't figure out why a phone's worth a thousand pounds, but anyway. Um, we're used to that market. In the Scala market, it's a very, very different marketplace. We are talking about, we are literally talking about technology that is older than you, right? It's 14, 50 years old. Um, and it's made some headlines, right? So back in 2005, uh, Russia, bless them, took out the Ukraine power grid uh, because they decided they didn't like Ukraine, they wanted to teach them a lesson. So they took out their power grid. Um, it was an interesting exercise because Ukraine power grid, okay, it's old, um, but it's still using technology that we use. It's still using technology that the West has very much invested a lot of our power grid. I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of months ago, I had a meeting with Southwest Water to discuss forensics, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. And we were discussing about forensics on scan systems, and I said, so do you know where your nodes are then? And they went, yes. And I looked at them, and they went, well, sort of. Can you expand upon that? Well, yes, we know where they are, it's just we're not quite sure where they are. Okay, this is worthy of exploration. Can you explore that, please? Right, what do you exactly mean by that? Well, we have this processing node in the field. Great. Now, we know it's in the field. Brilliant, because it's still talking to us. Good so far. We have just one problem. What's that? It's called 10 acre field, and it's underground. Right, so we know it's somewhere in this field somewhere. Right, but the only way we're going to find it is basically by a Land Rover driving up a mountainside through a forest to get to this field called Ten Acre Field to go poking around looking for an antenna. Um, so you get the idea about the nature of the technology that we're dealing with. Um, your water is provided via a SCADA-based industrial process control system. Russia takes attack against its infrastructure so seriously. Russian military doctrine views it as a deployment of a weapon of mass destruction, and they reserve the right to retaliate in kind. What does this mean? If any hacker in the UK takes out the Russian Moscow water grid, right, Russia are going to export a bucket load of sunshine to um, London. You may or may not view that as um, development. I come from South Wales, so for Newport, for those of you that are Welsh and know Newport, that definitely is regional development. Um, it improves the report no end. Um, but you get the idea about the nature of the threats that we're dealing with with these systems, right? They really are weapons of mass destruction. Um, if you turn the water off to London, you physically couldn't get enough clean water into London. People would die. You would have rioting on the streets. Then you imagine I'd turn the electricity off. Then I'd imagine I'd turn the ATM system off and the telephone system off. How many people here have more than 20 pounds in their pocket? Mug them on the way out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, management. Um, you get the idea, right? We really are talking about some quite serious stuff. Um, and um, it's getting more and more headlines because the technology, again, that we're talking about is old. It hasn't been updated. Yes, we can talk about modern scholar systems, right? You can talk about the latest Siemens and Schneider boxes. These are basically embedded Linux systems running BuzzyBox on an ARM core processor, right? And yeah, there's an element of security you can build around that. We're still talking about you know stuff that's out there that's 30 years old. So you go to these companies and you say, why don't you upgrade it? And they said, why should we? It works. Right? There are companies out there still running Windows XP. Why? It works. <laughs> Right, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right? Um, but these things are suddenly getting headlined because people have woken up to the fact that actually you can get at these systems. So what is a SCADA system? Well, in the good old days before the internet, and I'm old enough that I can remember days before the internet, right? My first internet connection was a 56k modem. Right, you can just about surf the internet on it if you were lucky. No content, no downloading, no torrents, no anything like that. Now I have kids, I wish I could go back to my 56k motor because I have more bandwidth. <laughs> right? When you have kids, your bandwidth and data storage capacity in the house goes up window. Right? These systems were isolated. 
They ran over RS232 networks, then kind of Ethernet came along, and they sort of ran them over Ethernet, but they never connected them to the internet. They ran on a security through kind of obscurity, we're going to physically be disconnected, right? You know, if you take ICI Wilton, when ICI Wilton existed, right? If you wanted to blow up ICI Wilton, you physically had to be there. Right? You couldn't do it by a network connection. There was no connection to the internet. Right? You had your connection to the control center. They were physically isolated, and hacking hadn't really happened. Um, now, we're talking about things being connected to the internet, right? because management think just-in-time supply chain is great. Isn't it? No. Um, it's all kinds of problems. Um, I want to know what my process control system is doing now, and I'm the managing director, and I want it on my PC. Like, why? I have a control room for that. Don't talk to them. Um, but you have the idea is you have this external connection, and in principle, you have some DNZ. I underline the word in principle. Um, I did a forensic job recently for a company who will remain nameless, and they had a tech core requirement that says you must have two firewalls, different vendors and they must be connected back to back and monitored. So they went out and they spent absolute fortune buying two top of the range firewalls, plugged them in back to back, tick, done. We've met our security requirements. Guess what they forgot? The firewalls came by default with a rule that said any, any. They just spent 100,000 pounds buying a piece of wire. <laughs> I went to them and I said, never mind the forensics, I'll save you 100,000 pounds, right? 10,000 pounds, I've got this lovely cat fire, cat fire cable, right? I'll even paint it for you, go paint it. Right? It's better than it's the same as your firewalls. Um, in principle, we have this DMZ. I underline the word in principle. Then we have a corporate network. Then we get into the data zone where actually we're talking about control rooms and things like that. And then we're down into talking about the actual control of HDMIs. Um, HDMI is the human interface level where you've got screens and you've seen these old, how many people have seen the kind of, uh, these disaster movies where you know the, the, the reactor blows up? Right? And everybody, nobody? Are you really on that? Okay, well, how many people have seen a movie called War Games? Yes, the film that launched a thousand hackers. Yeah, you know they're remaking it. Yeah, it won't be as good, but they're remaking it. How many people have seen the film called Hackers? Yeah, now how many, I'll be honest, how many people only watch that film for one reason and one reason only? And yes. that's because it had Anthony Jody in it. <laughs> <laughs> right? I have nothing to do with technology, but you know, I wish Hackers came like that. Um, right? Um, but we have these HDMI levels, and then they come down into switches, and then they come down into PLCs. Now, all the PLC does is it takes an analog signal and converts it to a digital signal, and it takes a digital signal and converts it to an analog signal. So I could have a temperature, I could have a thermometer, I could have a pressure gauge telling me about things. I could turn valves on and off, um, which is kind of good when you want to control these large, massive chemical manufacturing nuclear reactors. It's rather bad when you start talking the cooling system off for a nuclear reactor, and you end up with a, something that goes back. Um, but you get the idea. This technology down here, well, this technology is on a kind of three-year replacement round robin. You know, I need a new laptop, I need a new web server, I need a new computer. This down here, you're talking about 40, 50 years, and it's only replaced when it breaks. Now, you know, when we design old-fashioned PCBs with custom hard chips on it and things like that, they were kind of robust. Right, you know, the, the fabrication work, right, you know, we've got real problem with fabrication of high-end chips at the moment to do with the width of silicon and the number of atoms and what happens when a new one hits an atom in the fabrication. And you've actually got one chip and they're designed so that you have redundancy built in because the manufacturing process doesn't work properly because you have impurities in the silicon. Yeah, we didn't have any of that problem back in the 1970s, right? Your tracks were so big, your data tracks laid down on the silicon, you couldn't drive a car down it. Right? If, if you got hit by a straight new it didn't even matter. In fact, it hardly noticed, it didn't notice, come down to that. And they only get replaced when they break. Which from an adversary's point of view is great. Because it means that they weren't designed with security in mind. Right? Hell, the internet wasn't designed with security in mind. 
Right, as I say to my students, TCP was designed for one thing and one thing only. Part, positive acknowledgement with retransmission, getting data from A to B in a reliable manner. And you'll notice in describing TCPIP, I haven't used the word security at all, because it's not secure. It wasn't designed with security in mind, and security was a bit of an afterthought. Even when we did TCPIP v6, you think we'd have learned something, but no, we just wanted more things to connect to the internet. Because we can now in every single grain of sand on the planet access to the internet because every single grain of sand needs access to the internet for some reason. Best to be honest with other people, but not me. Um, so we have this really old technology. It's easy to get hold of, it's great to play with. SCADA as a technology wasn't designed with security in mind. It was designed basically for controlling nodes. Because it was designed with, for controlling nodes, that security was a bit of a bolt-on at the end, you end up putting wrappers around it to try and protect things. Now, how many people here have heard of a famous professor called Dijkstra? <laughs> yeah, see, Dijkstra is really interesting. Because back in the 1960s, he did an experiment, which is still true today. He asked himself the question, what is the relationship between a bug and a line of code? I.e., how many lines of code do I have before I have a bug? So he ran a series of experiments. He got a bunch of his students, set the programming examples, said they weren't allowed to test the code. They had to, you know, they were allowed to write it and look at it and, and debug it visually, but they weren't allowed to actually execute it. Right? And he found that the ratio was that was for every 200 lines of code, you had roughly one bug. Now, how many people here know how many lines of code there are in Windows 10? Some, something of the order of 70 million give or take a few million, but who cares? Uh, but it's okay, because Microsoft have told us bugs don't exist in their software anymore, but they're not using the word bug, they're using undocumented features, so their software <laughs> You may or may not choose to believe that. I think it's a great marketing term, anyway. Um, so, the question is, challenges are, how do we do forensics? Because I'm the type of person that people phone and shit happens. Andrew, my computer's been broken. Okay, fine. Um, and? <laughs> what do we do about it? Right? Um, you know, it's not working. Okay, switch it off. I'll come with my bug and tricks and, and down we go. The one problem with having a degree in computer science is that you become technical support for your family. That's <laughs> my mum phones. Right? My printer's not working. Yeah, and? Well, fix it. You haven't done what's wrong with it. It's not working. Okay, is it powered on? How would I know? <laughs> it gives me a long time. Um, but I'm the type of person that people phone because for some reason people think I know what I'm doing. I keep telling them I'm not, but they, they don't believe me. Um, and um, you have this problem with SCADA, right? How do you do forensics on SCADA? You see, when you get caught downloading porn on a Friday night, right, we come along and we take the hard drive and we analyse it. And we write a report saying, you know, the porn wasn't that bad, right? I've seen worse. <laughs> right? If you really wanted to download porn, you should go to the following sites. Right? Pamela Anderson, Gaffer Tate, yeah, I've seen it before. Right? Now, if you really want to do it, right? I once had the joy of doing a, a forensic job for a government department. Um, and I went back and I said, no, your system hasn't been hacked, but your, administrator, your system administrator has a serious foot fetish. Um, <laughs> you need to deal with it. He may or may not be vulnerable for um, coercion. Um, we come along, we grab the hard drive, right? We image it, we talk about tools like NKX and Access Data or Forensics Explorer, and we look at the images and we say, yes, he's a sad little buddy, take him down the docks, get him laid, he'll be happy, right? We won't be doing this again soon. Um, and that's how we do forensics on hard drives, right? It's a very different world in the embedded world, right? Even when we talk about forensics on phones, you take your phone, you plug it in, you get cell bright, right? You know, and cell bright creates an image of the phone, and again, you look at it and say, yada, yada. Right, you know, I think that Johnny was doing what he shouldn't have been doing on his phone, and off we go. Um, we're not talking about that, we're talking about embedded IoT, and this is getting worse. Right? I've been married for 25 years. 25 years ago, I bought a fridge. Our fridge recently broke, so my wife went out and bought a new one. Right? That's new fridge, £1,000. Does everything. You've got cooler. Right, you know, everything you want. It's even got a Wi-Fi connection. 
Now, I have yet to figure out why a fridge needs a Wi-Fi connection. And if anybody can think of any good reason why a fridge needs a Wi-Fi connection, I'd love to talk to you because I can't. Um, I'm getting out to thinking of disabling the Wi-Fi. I've identified the Wi-Fi chip in the fridge. So I'm about to take a 9mm drill bit to it to drill it out because that's how you turn the Wi-Fi off on the fridge. You, know, if you don't trust it in software, you're going to remove it by hardware. Um, you know, fridges have Wi-Fi connections, right? I mean, you know, your car, right, is a mobile computer, right? Gone are the dead. When I was 16, my brother bought an MG, right? And now my brother is a DIY disaster, right? So he brought an MG, he decided he wanted to fix the engine, change the oil. So he took the engine to pieces, put it back together again, had some bits left. <laughs> so I took the engine to pieces, put it back together again, had a different set of bits left. <laughs> this didn't go well. Um, I consequently spent most of the summer when I was 16 rebuilding his MG um, with the Hayes manual because he wasn't going to look at the manual, right? Because he's a man. And men don't look at manuals. <laughs> they look like a sissy, right? And so, you know, we have this problem, right? That view of your car is gone. When you take your car to the galleries, they plug in the computer, they run a piece of software, and the software tells them what's wrong with the car and tells them how to fix it, right? So your car mechanic has become a software engineer. Why? Because your car has become an embedded computer, right? So how do we do forensics on that? Well, luckily, I spend a lot of my time doing forensics on high-end cars. Um, and I can tell you some really interesting, funny stories about things people have done or should not have done with high-end cars. Um, so we had a thing that doesn't decide. We had a murder case, right? Guy gets arrested. He's got a high-end Merc. Right, police arrest him. And they say, oh, it's a beautiful car. Oh, yeah. Love of my life. Really nice car. Right, you know, I wouldn't let my wife drive. No, no one drives that car but me. You sure about that? That's a fragging loopy. No one drives that car by me. Why? Where were you on Saturday? I was at home with my wife. That's interesting, because your car was at emergency. Now the moment the police were saying to me, you know, are you the only person who drives your car? I've got an alarm bell going off. You go, no. Will your wife drive? I have no idea where my car's been. Right? We can show, because of the sat nav system on the car, we can even show it was him for two reasons. One, he plugged his phone in and his phone had synced to the car. And two, how many people have cars that have customized settings for when you get in the car and the car detects who you are by magic? See, management. <laughs> <laughs> right? He's obviously, he's obviously doing management work. Right? Do you know how that works? Your car weighs you. Right? It weighs your body weight. And it decides, oh, there was somebody who weighs 17 stone who owns this car. I'm going to configure it for them. So we actually knew how much the driver weighed that drove to the murder scene. And you're like, let's get this right. He weighs the same as you. He has your phone. He drives your car. And you're saying you're the only one who drives your car. Yeah, I think we've gone beyond the reasonable doubt at one time. All of that was because of a new computer system, an embedded computer system. Which we can kind of get to in the car, because you can kind of pull the dashboard off and things like that. You have problems, because you can't let me sell that. Actually, the biggest problem Mets have at the moment with car forensics is when you do forensics on the car, you can't sell the car again. Right? Because you're giving them the car back in pieces. You know, this is your dashboard. Right? I've taken it to pieces. Um, so, we have this problem, right? They're designed, star systems are designed to be automated, they're connected to the internet, they span huge geographical areas. And I mean huge. Right? If you take America, Right, a power distribution company has a has a scarlet grid that spans America. Right, you know, we're not just talking about a little region like London. You're talking about half the globe. Um, may include proprietary and legacy devices. Right, may include chips for which the technical specs no longer exist. Right, because you start looking at the scarlet device and you go, "Ooh, it's got a Texas TI seven three two one chip." I know, I'll Google that. And Google says, no such results. <laughs> right? That's okay, I'll phone Texas. And Texas go, you what? What chip? No, we don't make that. <laughs> if you didn't, it's got your logo on it, mate. Right? No, don't have that. Right? So, you know, you're down to reverse engineering chips. Right? How many people here with a degree in electrical engineering? 
Yeah, you see, well, you have a future, the rest of them, no. <laughs> right? They're all going to end up being Java programmers and be really sad. These are the next engineers who plug things and measure things and start doing voltage in and voltage out and understand stuff. Right? And I kid you not, we're down to that level. Right? Uh, no real guidance or methodologies for data acquisition. We got set a challenge by Airbus two years ago to stand up the forensic capability to do forensics on SCAR systems. Why? Because factory of the future is here. Right? Airbus have just built a massive aircraft building plant in Mobile, Alabama, the deep south. Those people that voted for Trump. You're supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> right? um, it, now ask me how many people it employs. A hundred. Are they building things? No. They're looking after the computers. And the robots are building things. Right? How many people have seen Terminator? Yeah, you said that's a really bad news for you. It's going to happen. Right? Um, there's no real guidance on that. So the case was, we have a problem. We're building a multi-billion pound factory. And egg, okay, we're going to put in all the measures you can imagine to protect it, and it's going to be pen tested, and we're going to have firewalls up in the zoo, and it's going to be linked into a network operation centre halfway around the globe, and we're going to monitor it 24 by 7. But what do we do when it's hacked? Because you can't necessarily just turn it off and turn it on again, right? You actually have to do something about it, which means you have to go and get data from these devices, and we don't understand the methodology to do that. And that's effectively what we got asked to do. That's what we're going to talk about now. Um, so we are actually the only people in the UK currently that have a forensic SCADA capability. If somebody picks up the phone and says, Andrew, I have a SCADA note, and I need you to come and analyze it, we can actually go and analyze it. Um, so the problem that you have is you're dealing with a wide variety of data sources. Right? I shit you not. Right? So, when we do forensics on a hard drive, it's okay, it's running NTFS. Right? There's only one data source, that's the NTFS file system. When I'm doing forensics on SCADA, I'm talking about the management computers running uh, probably Windows. Okay, so that's an NTFS file system. But then I've got all the networking traffic, right? I've got routers and firewalls and NetFlow logs to figure out what's going on. Okay, so I'm up to three or four, let's call it three. Um, then I've got all the HDMI formats. Well, that custom file system, if I'm lucky, they'll be EXT3 or 4. If I'm really unlucky, they'll be something custom that they've built after reverse engineering. So I'm going to put at least six there. right? And then I get down onto the chip formats. If I'm lucky, they're using modern chips and they flashed it. That's great. I can read that as a binary directory. If it's not, I'm easily up to about 10 at this point in time. And I have to analyze and fuse all of that data together. Forensics has now become a big data problem. But well, we kind of knew that. Right? If you go back to the London 77 bombing, right, they had 20 forensic artifacts, each person that they arrested. There was a hotel in London for a week after the bombing where literally they had every single forensic expert in the UK, who police law enforcement, in that hotel forensically analysing and imaging those devices to build up an idea of what was there. So we knew forensics had gone down the big data road. What we didn't know was we thought, well, big data means lots of hard drives, HMS hard drives, can analyze that, process that, got a cloud environment, great. What we didn't realize was that it meant lots and lots of legacy systems that everyone has lost because they were written on tight written paper and they haven't been scanned, and the idea you can Google them is a joke. Um, so we have this wide variety of data sources, right? We have a problem. Whoops. Wasn't me. Right. We have a problem as well. You see, when you get caught downloading porn, right, I can switch the computer off. How many tap with any data? Well, okay, the memory's gone, but if, the, if you've been downloading porn onto the hard drive, it's still there. Right? If I'm talking about a um, SCADA system, I'm talking about a system that when you switch it off, resets the memory. And actually, it's the memory that I want, so I have to do a live acquisition on it. I don't know about you, but if a nuclear reactor is about to go bang, I really don't want to be sat underneath a nuclear reactor with a soldering iron and an oscilloscope, right? And not unless I want a suntan. That's <laughs> a really bad idea, right? I mean, you're going to end up in some really bad places when you look at some of the chemical ones. And as well, you've got some things in nodes where like, people can't go in there. You've got a process node in there. Yeah, you can't go in there. Why? It'll kill you. Great, that's a big tissue. Very expensive. I think I'll write great. Right? 
Um, so we have this problem, live, live acquisition or order of volatility. We also have a problem that we don't understand how long the data is going to live for. You see, if your data is written to your hard drive, well, it's kind of there until it gets overwritten. And, you know, we've now got a big hard drive. We've got 10 terabyte hard drives. If you look at helium hard drives, we're talking about 100 terabytes, right? Do you know how long it takes to forensic helium to 10 terabyte hard drive? 48 hours. How long does it take to forensic helium to a 100 terabyte hard drive? This isn't a trick question, guys. Forty <laughs> Some young men can't do maths. 480 hours. Right? You have a problem in the forensic world because when the police arrest you, how long can they hold you for? 24 hours. After 24 hours, they have to go to a high court judge. They get a 24 hour extension. What have they got to do after 48 hours? Charge you or release you. How long does it take to forensic give you to 10 terabyte drive? 48 hours. <laughs> I have police officers that have said to me, if they ever see my name on a warrant, right, they're going on holiday. <laughs> right, right, because I have an awful lot more than four than ten terabytes at my home. Okay, my kids use it, but the police don't know that. Right, don't tell them. Um, so we have this problem, right? How long is the data going to last? Where is the data? Do you know where the data is? Right? Verification, calculating hash values. Well, that's not too bad. You've got to be able to get the data first. Um, response time, it's in a field. Great, it's called 10 acre field. Right, we're getting in, a, it's, this is great when you start doing this, because you get to go to your boss and say, I want a really expensive Land Rover. Why? Because I'm going to be going off road. Right, I need a generator in the back, I need all of this stuff, because I need to be able to set up a fully operational transit lab in the middle of a field. Right, it's great, it also talks about it. Um, so, geographical areas. Right, audit functions are, uh, yeah, disabled. I did a forensic job for a, a defense contractor um, that had been done over by China. And um, they said, we've been, we've, we've been certified APT clear. We've had somebody in and they've given us a tick in the box to say, we're APT clear. But we don't believe them because we're seeing odd things. Can you please come in and do an investigation? Yeah, sure, no problems. Right, um, so let's talk about auditing. And they said, yeah, we're going to do that. I said, what? Yeah, it just takes up too much disk space. Well, not even log on and log offs. No. <laughs> Luckily, the network guy who ran the network was ably retentive and kept network data, so we ended up rebuilding a model of their system to figure out who logged on and who logged off, purely based upon network data. Boy, that was fun. Um, but, yes, you can guarantee that because you're talking about technology that's 30 years old, and security didn't exist, they turned off every logging function known to man. Why? Well, we don't need logging data, do we? Um, and the real problem is absence of dedicated forensics tools. You see, when they phone me and they say, little John, he's been downloading pornography, I go and I get my forensic kit, and I've got my NKs and my access data and my cell rise, and I go and he needs the phone or the call the laptop, and I say, yes, it's not as bad as you think it is, right, it's not real porn. Well, it's real porn, all this stuff. Um, luckily, our, our forensic lab knows the porn lab. Um, I've the finest collections of the laundry lab. Um, <laughs> you're, you're not, right? What were you doing in the forensic study? Right? We had students queuing up to help us out with the forensic study. Not because they want forensic stuff, but they just want to get paid to look at porn. Because pretty much every hard drive we bought had porn on it. Right? Um, we have no real forensic tools in this space. So you end up getting an oscilloscope out and pencil and paper and using hardware development environments, right? And you know, how many people here can actually program in C? Right? Because yeah, you, <laughs> you might have a job as well. Um, because you're gonna end up programming in C because C maps really well down onto the hardware. Java on the other hand sucks. <laughs> right? Java shit. <laughs> and whoever invented Java should have been shot. There's only one programming language you need, and that's See, in my opinion, that and Python, right? How do you think the programming go? No, go, no, yeah, get a proper job. Right. <laughs> so Go was Google's vanity project on Kearney Good and Ritchie will pay them a fortune to rewrite the language they wanted to write, and we'll call it Go, because then it looks like Google did it, and it's like, it's just C with sort of funny objects, and Bjorn Biafra did it earlier, we called it C++. 
Um, so, whoops, prepare. Understand your system architecture. We're dealing with technology that's 40 years old. I guarantee you, when you go out and you start talking to people about SCADA, right, they won't have a Scoobies about actually what they've got or what they think they've got unless the system's brand spanking new. It's 40 years old, right? When they say it came with 16, right, that's K if you're lucky, not megabytes and certainly not gigabytes. Um, Understand the nature of the potential attack vectors that you're talking about, or at least try to get the customer to understand it so they can put in other suitable countermeasures. Um, determine the type of attack, right? I said, yeah, it's great, I have the best job in the world. I either get paid to break shit or to break into shit, um, or I get paid to figure out how someone broke into shit, right? <laughs> and someone prepared to pay me to do this? <laughs> it's great, right? They're mugs, but I do it for free. They'll, t they'll tell me the list of that. Um, you have problems determining vector areas. I used to work for the MOD, and the MOD suffered a cyber attack. Uh, <laughs> have suffered many cyber attacks. Uh, I used to be the chief. I used to be the chief um, cyber lead for the um, DSTL. It's all offensive and defensive cyber projects running across my desk. And um, we had this problem that there was a virus outbreak on the MOD network, or well, one of many. Um, so some bright spot came up with the idea: of, I know, let's identify the infected area. Now, luckily, it was only the Navy that was infected. Anyone here ex-Navy? No? Good. Why don't we slide them off? Um, so some bright spots, well, I know what we'll do. We'll disconnect the Navy network from the rest of the MOD network, and then we can kind of, you know, clear that up later. But our main network will be okay. And I kid you not, somebody was going to do this until I sat there and basically said, excuse me, we have a problem with that. And they said, what's that? I said, it's called the nuclear firing chain. <laughs> Right? The nuclear firing chain runs through the MOD network. And what happens when you disconnect the Navy network from the MOD network? The nuclear firing chain interprets that as a preemptive strike against London and launches an attack. Right? There's nothing you think that's bad. It gets worse. Right? The nuclear firing chain also relies on Radio 4. Every day at 9 o'clock, the nuclear submarines tune in to Radio 4, to the Today program. And if the Today program isn't being broadcast, they think London's been nuked, right? And therefore, they retaliate. Great! All you've got to do is start nuking water, just take out the BBC. <laughs> Radio 4. Um, so, isolation. Identify if you can isolate. Often with SCADA, you can't. Right? If you take, if you take ISO Wilton, for example, when Wilton was around, um, they had chemical processors that would cost £10 million pounds to shut down. And if they shut them down, they knew they could never start them up again. So you may be in an environment where you want to, con you want to contain infected areas, but you can't because of the nature of the business process that you're dealing with. This is where friends get really interesting because you don't want to be friends. You don't worry about the business process. Right? The managing director has been called downloading porn. Great. Go and grab his computer. Right, the managing director gets to pay a holiday, everyone is suddenly productive. Um, it doesn't matter about the business process, it does when you're talking about SCADA. You have to understand the nature of the business process that you're dealing with. Because going in and doing the, it's okay, I'm an IT person, I'm going to unplug it, because that's what my forensic training told me to do. Right? Yes, you can do that with a hard drive, possibly. There are certain conditions when you can't, but we'll go with the fact that for most of them you can. Um, for a SCADA system, you probably can't, so you're going to be analysing the system in situ. And this gives rise to a bunch of other problems related to reproducibility. See, if I take your hard drive and I forensically image it, and then you forensically image it, and Greg forensically images it, in principle, that's all the same image because we've used white blockers, it's the same MP5 hash, etc, etc. When you're doing it on a volatile system, guess what? You only get one chance to get the data, because if you will try to get the data again, it's changed. And then you have to defend that in court of law. Um, triage. Identify your data sources and prioritize. If you're talking about a SCADA node that only has 16K of memory and is processing that at 1K per hour, how many hours have you got before you've overwritten all the data? Sick God. You look really into a maths course. 16 hours. What's 2 plus 2? <laughs> Four. 
right? Uh, prioritize your data sources. That means that presumably means you understand your data sources and you know where they are. Because chances are you probably don't. Right? Now, I kid you not. I've done forensics for a company where they said, oh, websites hacked. We had to go around the company and systematically switch every single computer in the, in the company off to figure out where the web server was. Because it wasn't where they thought it was. They thought it was in a rack in their server room. They had a beautiful hole in their rack in the server room for you rack where their web server should have been. But it wasn't. It was under somebody's desk. Did they know that? No. They have to turn every computer off to find out. Um, perform data acquisition, right? Get out your, go and buy it really, this is great, right? You get to buy really expensive oscilloscopes, I kid you not, right? We were specking out an oscilloscope recently for a friend in John, and it started at £20,000 and went up to £50,000 in order to do the speeds we were looking at. And then once you've got that, you've got to be able to perform data analysis. And finally, you have to write a report. Now this is where most security people struggle. Right, why? Well, because if, like me, you're dyslexic, I took English language O level six times, and guess what? I failed it six times. I can't write for toffee, that's why I got married. Um, I did my wife, and my, I paid my kids to approve all my writing, because my writing is terrible. Um, so I can imagine what it's like for everybody else. So, there we go, the challenges of forensics. Any questions? Have I scared you all shitless? And you're all going to move out of London and buy a cottage in the hills with its own water supply. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, very enlightening, by the way. Gary uh, Fatal. Um, if I were to summarize what you just talked about, would it be fair to say that we are so ill prepared to the consequences of cyber warfare if it is to take place? Would you say that is? Uh, high, medium, or low? We're completely unprepared. The only thing that's keeping us alive at the moment is the uh, mutually, mutually assured destruction argument that basically says everyone's got this problem because everyone's got the same technology. Right, okay, you know, for Ukraine it was very old technology, but it's still technology that we've got in the UK. And the argument is, well, if you can do it to us, we can do it to you. Here's my follow-up question then. You, in one of your uh, previous slides, you brought in the um, uh, the Syrian uh, yes. electronic army, yeah. um, which is an area that we have really um, uh, investigated. Yeah. When you are dealing with nation states who do concern themselves with the response, if you were to go and attack them, just like for example, for example, allegedly, yeah. when Russia. Uh, like the, uh, the, new, the uh, Ukrainian power plant. But when you have non-state actors, like destruction motivated cyber terrorists, like ISIS, or proxies of certain nations, and you don't know who to attribute this to, guess what? Now we are totally exposed. Would you not say that the threat now becomes far more real than it, it, it could happen at any time? Um, yeah, uh, it's certainly true that if you look at the attacks, if you go back like 10 years, people were talking about it, they were theorizing about it, but they weren't really what you'd attribute as serious attacks. So now when you look at the likes of Ukraine, and you look at the likes of the attack of, you know, there was a steel mill that was done in Germany recently, um, you know, it's suddenly becoming a lot more common because people have proved that it works, right? So people are starting to look at it and effectively say, yeah, you can have serious impacts. I mean, look, what is the purpose of terrorism? The purpose of terrorism is to inflict terror, right? You know, the old you know, adage was, you know, why haven't terrorists made more use of this? Well, it's a skill factor, right? But the problem that you have with that is if you, get, if you go back 30 years and you wanted to be a pen tester, you programmed in C. Why? Because the internet hadn't happened. You had to write your own port scanning tools, etc., etc. Now what's happened? Yeah, we have core impacts. What do you do when you do a pen test? This is great, right? Okay, so core impact, 30,000 pounds per license. This is a great tool, because what you do is you go and you plug it into their network and you get an IP address. They give you an IP address, you type it in, and then you click the button go, and it goes and does everything for you. And then you click the, you click the button generate report, and it generates a report for you. And you just own every single machine on their network why? Because for £30,000 you get an exploit for every single CPU that's out there. So you can pretty much break into every single network that's out there. And it's great! Because it's idiot proof. 
right? So we have this problem that the technology that's out there, you know, if you go, what we're talking about now, the inventor systems, it's, it's bespoke, it's hard, you need to understand, you know, be able to talk hexadecimal, but actually you are starting to see, you know, I mean, I'm involved with a tech startup that's in the process of developing, called Arwin, that's in, pro, that's in the process of developing forensic tools for Scala systems. Now, okay, we're starting from the modern Scala systems and working backwards, but you get the idea, right, the technology's out there and people are playing with it, things like that. And your question actually opens up a larger problem of attribution. There is no cyber law, right? Um, I was part of the team responsible, I was with the MOT when we set up JCU. Now, JCU was the offensive and defensive arm of the MOT. Um, it was actually a national secret that we did offensive cyber until some MP stood up in Parliament and said, Tell me about offensive cyber. And everyone was like, GCHQ went, Bollocks! <laughs> because it's just declassified it. Um, so we do offensive cyber, and that's the only unclassified statement you can say in the offensive cyberspace, because everything else is classified in TS strap. Um, we, set, we set it up right, to try and skin it, because under the, law, under the law of armed conflict, the only people that can kill are the military. What does this mean? If I'm going to use a cyber weapon to kill somebody, the only person that can be sat at the end of the keyboard legally has to be wearing a green, blue, or light blue uniform. Right? You don't have hackers inside GCHQ, right, unless they are seconded into the MOD unit actually doing it. Um, now, in the West, we have a really strict policy about we don't use mercenaries, we haven't used them since, since the Second World War, we don't have a law of cyber. Why? Hmm. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, actually. Um, because we would religiously adhere to it, nobody else would. Right? Why? Well, Russia say they didn't engage in a cyber attack when they went into Georgia. It just so happened that at the time when the Georgian hacker hacked the Georgian networks was at the exact moment that the, Georg that the Russian military crossed over into Georgia and the first the Georgian government knew about it was when Russian tanks were rolling down the high street and sat in front of the parliament because he'd taken out the network. Now that was either the luckiest hack in the world, right, that somebody got it spot on right, <coughs> or, right, Russia making use of mercenaries. And it is Russian military doctrine and it is Chinese military doctrine that they will make use of mercenaries. Right, so we have this problem in the cyber world in that NATO, of which we are part, religiously adheres to the law of armed conflict. You would not believe the planning process. If you want to drop a bomb on a plane, you would not believe the planning process that the MOD go through to try and minimize the casualties. I'll give you an example. First Gulf War, the RAF had an opportunity to take out Saddam Hussein because they knew he was going to be in the restaurant, right? They didn't because they didn't have eyes on the restaurant. They couldn't confirm he was there and they weren't prepared to live with the civilian casualties. So we have very strict rules in warfare, which we religiously apply to cyber warfare. On the other hand, you have lots of other people out there that are less scrupled and motivated than us. Um, so it's a really good question. Cyber warfare is actually something that the UN are looking at at the moment. And they are, they are really, really struggling with it because it's what does it mean? Right, you know, where do you differentiate? Where do you where do you draw the boundaries? Right, you know, you have the army, they stand up in colours and things like that. That doesn't work in cyberspace. Any more questions? Yes, sir. So talk about forensic, if something goes so if something goes wrong with your star systems, how do you go about uh, you know, analyzing and doing some forensics? But if I as a business want to understand how secure my star system is before something goes wrong, uh, how do you recommend I uh, there are pen test teams out there that will do pen tests on SCADA systems. Um, what you actually find is you're going to spend a fortune on lawyers first um, because the NDAs and the non-disclosure and the liability you're going to want is going to be astronomical. Because um, you're like, if I do a pen test on Ernst & Young, right, you know, and I break in and I bring down a server, great, I brought down a server, nobody dies, nothing explodes, Right, okay, management run around and go, I can't read an email, which may or may not be a plus. Um, but, you know, nothing bad happens. When you're doing that in a SCADA system, and you bring down a SCADA node, or you bring down the HDMI or something like that, you run a real danger that things go, bang! 
right? And then you have fireballs, and they call it Bhopal and things like that. So pen testing on SCADA systems is really dangerous. And you know, those people I know who do it spend an absolute massive amount of time planning out exactly what they're doing, when they're doing it, and how they're doing it, and they test it to the systems that they're doing it so they know they're not going to go bang. That it really, really costs a fortune. Um, you know, it's much, much harder because the nature of the systems that you're dealing with, because you know, when we do it in you know normal ICT infrastructure, you know, those young websites come down. Great. Okay, you know, people get upset and they run around and boom, panic, right? But nobody, nobody died, right? If you take down the PLC, yeah. <laughs> you don't know where that PLC is. It's in a 10 acre field. It's controlling the chlorine going into the water supply, right? Great, we just poisoned all of Cardiff. Now, okay, that may or may not be an improvement. Certainly it wasn't for you, But, you know, you get the idea. Uh, the point we have is, you know, they're like, I kid you not, it was in 10 acre, 10 acre field. Where? I don't know. Don't you have a map? Oh, yeah, yeah, we had a map. What do you mean you had a map? Well, we were in the process of digitizing it, and then a bunch of paperwork got thrown out, and it was in the paperwork that got thrown out. Okay, great. Have you not thought, uh, uh, what would you do it? Well, we replace it. Really? Okay. Do you know what that scar does? No, not really. Why, it controls something. Chlorine, I think. What? I'm sorry. Chlorine? You know what chlorine does, don't you? Right? I mean, you know, we bombed Syria over chlorine. Right? You know, you just imagine that's great. It's a big chlorine plume over Cardiff, right? I mean, you know, who would know? Um, you get the idea. It's a real, real problem that we have in this space. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think that was a very entertaining talk. Um, we're running out of time. <laughs> Yeah, the summary. Yeah. Um, so, uh, 